Okay, so this is our vascular neuro talk. So first case, we've got a non-contrast axial CT and we're at two different levels here, one through the ventricles and one a little bit lower down. And what we're seeing is some hemorrhage, right? And right through here and a little bit more here and a little bit here and here. So we've got some subarachnoid hemorrhage. So there's a couple different ways that cases can be worked around with regard to subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, and the first question you want to ask yourself is, is the subarachnoid along the vertex? Those are usually trauma and vasculopathy cases. Or is the subarachnoid more basal or dependent? And those are the situations when you think about aneurysm. Now, the location of the bleed uh, will help you guess where the aneurysm is. Uh, I don't, th I mean, you could argue this is useful for when you do eventually do the CTA, you, you, you can zero in on where to look, but there's a variety of reasons why it's not useful. One, aneurysms are often multiple, so you still have to look everywhere. Um, so that's it's, it's a little bit silly. So, but uh, silly things lend themselves well to multiple choice, especially something like this, because it's a clear-cut situation where things are testable. So ACOM bleeds tend to be in between the interhemispheric fissure. PCOM bleeds tend to be on one side of the basal cistern or the other, depending on the PCOM. MCA aneurysms are typically further out, like M2, M3 bifurcation, trifurcation zones. So that tends to be out in the sylvian fissure. Basal or tip just will light up the whole bottom of the um, uh, basilar cisterns often. If you see just a little bit, it's loaded around the interpendicular cistern, which makes sense because of where the basilar artery lays. Uh, and pica, um, also posterior fossa or interhemispheric. I think the ones that are the most easily testable are this one and this one because a lot of these other ones overlap so if you're going to remember any, it would be those two. And those are the two that probably make the most sense. So let's go back to our case here. So it's at a basilar level, so we're thinking aneurysm. And it's mo mainly like interhemispheric, right? A little bit at a higher level, same general vicinity, and a little bit of interventricular too. But if you get enough blood, that's going to track into the ventricle. So this is an ACOM aneurysm, probably. So where do aneurysms occur and why do they occur? Um, so they occur at branch locations, like there, and they typically these berry aneurysms occur at areas of vascular weakness, which just so happen to be at branch points, which is sort of what you'd expect. The vast majority of them occur in the anterior circulation, so those are your ACA, ACOM, and MCA, uh, aneurysms, and a minority of them are like basilar tip at the peak of bifurcation. That's around 15%. So I mentioned this before, aneurysms are associated with other aneurysms. So about 20% of the time they're multiple. Now there are a bunch of different syndromes. You probably remember from prior lectures I mentioned polycystic kidney disease any kind of collagen vascular disease like Marfan's, Ehlers-Danlos, those kinds of people. And uh, aortic coarctation also has an increased incidence of um, baryaneurysm. So subarachnoid hemorrhage has three complications that occur at different times. And because of that, it lends itself well to, there's a, a multiple testable points. Well, first one is the timing. So we've got early, mid, and late side effects of subarachnoid. So early on, the guy comes into the ER, he's got the worst headache of his life, and you see subarachnoid everywhere. You will often see this. So this is your early side effect of subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is 
hydrocephalus. Why does that occur? The blood basically obstructs the absorption of CSF. So you often see this early on. So hydrocephalus early on. Um, mid, and I'm going to define mid here in a second, you often see this. So this is your CTA, and notice that you just have a lot of pruned vessels or just straight up absent vessels in this general area. Look how skinny some of these areas are. Look at it over here, skinny, too skinny. So it's like there's diffuse vasospasm. So who gets vasospasm? So does everybody who has subarachnoid hemorrhage get vasospasm? Um, when does it occur? Who's at more risk for it? So the easy way to remember it is uh, more blood equals more risk. There's this thing called the Fisher score. It was developed by some neurosurgeon in the early 80s to grade the risk of vasospasm, and it's like one to four. But basically when you get above one millimeter in maximum thickness, then you become at an increased risk. Interventricular hemorrhage is even more risk. It's like a grade four. So... More blood, more risk. So what, what is vasospasm? What does that mean? Um, basically, the vessels in the head hate laying in blood. It's an irritant. So they freak out and they spasm. But they have to sort of, they can only take so much. So it doesn't happen right away. It has to, like, wear them down. Uh, there's some kind of a mechanism that, that says that the oxyhemoglobin is actually a bigger irritant or down-regulates a nitric oxide, which you may remember from med school as a vasodilator. Um, so it's defined basically as multiple arterial territories. Um, and if it's, if it's missed, I mean, it's, it can be a serious thing because it can lead to stroke. So does vasospasm only occur in the setting of subarachnoid hemorrhage? No, of course not. So um, there's other things in your head that can irritate vessels, pus is the big one that I think about, meningitis, but there's several other weird things. Press can have vasospasm. Um, there's a syndrome called reversible cerebral vasospasm syndrome, which is basically, think about a pregnant woman with a like worst headache in my life situation. You get the head CT and there's no blood, and if they decided to do a CTA on her, uh, that would show vasospasm, and it they have pretty decent outcomes, but it is a syndrome that's sort of seen in that classic clinical scenario. Uh, migraine, patients with migraine uh, will also sometimes have vasospasm. So when does it occur? This is probably the most testable point of the three or the things that I've mentioned with vasospasm. When does vasospasm occur? So it does not occur right away. It occurs like 4 to 14 days out. Um, so like I said, it has to, the vessels have to bake in the blood for a while, or you can remember that you have to have that oxyhemoglobin that starts messing with that nitric oxide pathway. So it does not occur right away. Uh, the classic scenario is like the patient is bled, then they go and they get their aneurysm clipped, and you know it's been a while, and then after the aneurysm clip follow-up, then they end up with a vasospasm. Uh, so a couple of days out. So here's our last one. This is our late complication of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And notice that we've got some low signal sort of coating the outside of the or the the, the outside of the brain here, and uh, it's blooming. So this is superficial siderosis. So a couple of things you need to know about that. First one is a classic multiple choice scenario where they show you superficial siderosis, no history provided, and then you have to do a ne kind of next step question. They want you to recognize that that is superficial siderosis and that it occurs because of bleeding. And so they want you to get a CTA or an MRA to look for the source. Some pl places you'll read will tell you that you need to get spine imaging as well. So superficial siderosis is a side effect of repeated episodes of subarachnoid hemorrhage, and they can be just tiny little drips of blood. Um, but the most important thing that you need to know about this for the purpose of multiple choice is the clinical history. 
Like, why did they show up in the family medicine clinic? Um, it's not the worst headache of my life situation that you have with acute hemorrhage. Uh, when you see something like this, this has been going on for a while. So what they have is they have sensory neural hearing loss. That's the thing to remember. They also have ataxia. Um, they have both usually. But the thing to remember is sensory, sensory neural hearing loss. If you need a method to remember that, just think the um, the brain's not the only thing that's getting coated with this hemocytor. It's also uh, coating some of the nerves, and that's messing with, with your hearing. Um, whether or not that's the actual mechanism or not, I don't know, but it is one way to remember it. Um, so that could show up in the, what does this person have? No history, just a picture. What does this person have? It could also be used as a clue in the history. Uh, they could use that to make you work backwards into a next step question and to look for the aneurysm. Lots of different ways. Superficial siderosis, the long sequela of subarachnoid hemorrhage, sensory neural hearing loss. All right, so here's the next case. This is a scrollable one. Move up and down here. Move back. So what do you think? Does this guy need a CTA? He does not. So this is a trick. This is a pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage. What's going on is you've got diffuse cerebral edema, which makes the brain darker, and then relative to that, uh, this, the um, dura and the cisterns look brighter. Um, so how do you tell the difference? So here are the tricks. Look at the sulci. If you can't see the sulci, he probably has cerebral edema. If you have enough hemorrhage to make it look like it does in this picture, where you've got blood outlining the basal or cisterns, um, you should also have hemorrhage in the sulci. So look at the sulci. Uh, actually, the first thing you want to do is look at your multiple choice options. If this isn't one of them, and that's not where they're going with the question, don't get hung up on it. If pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage is a possibility based on the question choice and you're trying to decide between that and actual subarachnoid hemorrhage, you want to look at the sulci. Um, something that could also be asked, uh, but is probably more of a practical pearl, is that the pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage isn't dense enough. So real subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, will measure around 60 Hounsfeld units. Pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage will measure around 30 or 40. So, next case is three different patients, all with the same underlying cause. So, what I'm showing here is bleed here in the pons, bleed here in the putamen region, bleed here in the thalamus with intraventricular extension. So, all three of these patients have hypertension. These are the classic locations. The other classic location that you could have with a hypertensive bleed is a big fucking lobar hemorrhage. But, and I'll talk about that later on with an amyloid case, um, if you see a giant lobar hemorrhage, you have to think about three things. One, hypertensive hemorrhage. Two, amyloid. And three, a hemorrhagic mat. So remember, MRCT for your hemorrhagic metastasis, M for melanoma, R for renal cell. You can have MRI, islet cell tumors, the I, uh, C, uh, carcinoid, and T for thyroid. So the hypervascular mets stay hypervascular when they go to the head, and they can bleed. And if they were going to show a case like that, they would have to show you T1 post-contrast imaging to look for an underlying mass. Um, but back to hypertensive hemorrhage, the classic looks, basal ganglia and pons. And the way that I uh, remember the basal ganglia thing is that these vessels that come off sort of come off at acute angles like that. And when they're hit with a lot of pressure, they explode. Um, whether or not that's actually true or not, debatable, but that is a way that I used to remember it. Um, all right, next case. So this is a T1 post-contrast image. How did I know it was T1? Um, the CSF is dark, okay. 
How do I know it's not flare? White matter is white on T1. Okay, so following it up with this, all right, gamesmanship time. Gamesmanship time, we've got a gradient. There are three scenarios when you're going to be shown a gradient image. One is this, um, which is amyloid. You've got multiple different microhemages, both lobes. Uh, buzzword is a different, uh, different stages, bleeds at different stages. It's a little hard to tell here. They're all sort of old, right? Um, remember I said that you can have a presentation of amyloid that has a big lobar hemorrhage, but they will have to tell you that the patient does not have hypertension, um, and they would have to prove to you that they didn't have an underlying mass by showing you post-contrast imaging. Um, and although be careful with that because uh, you know a hematoma can enhance potentially, but it shouldn't enhance like a mass. You should be able to tell the difference. So three things: um, one, amyloid; two, cavernoma. That's usually a solitary thing, even though there is familiar types where they're multiple, but um, that would be really sneaky. So one amyloid, two cavernoma, three. Um, is to prove there either is is a bleed or there is not a bleed uh, because remember that blood products like little magnets the iron like little magnets the hemoglobin like little magnets and that causes local field inhomogeneity which causes a blooming artifact so these are your three so if you see susceptibility sequence think it's either an amyloid case the cavernoma case or it's a this person has a bleed or does not have a bleed case. Those are the three reasons to show it. So this is amyloid. It's multifocal. I'll tell you, or they would have to tell you um, that the patient has normal blood pressure. It would be nice also if they would tell you that they're old and that they have renal failure and they're on dialysis and like all the classic things that make you think about amyloid. They're typically in a subcortical location. And like I said, uh, you can get a big lobar bleed with amyloid, just like you can get a big lobar bleed with hypertensive, hypertension. Uh, the clinical history would distinguish, and that would have to be provided for you. Okay, so next case. Give you a second to look at it. All right, so you may have noticed that the basal ganglia is missing or disappeared buzzword on this side, or you may have noticed that that whole MCA territory has loss of gray-white differentiation. So why does that happen? It's basically a cytotoxic anema. What the hell does that mean? Remember, you've got a sodium-potassium pump that is an active transport pump, and that helps regulate the amount of water that are inside of cells. So if you die, if the cell dies, or it doesn't have oxygen, so it can't run the electron transport chain, so it can't make ATP, then you end up leaking and that causes cytotoxic edema, and that blurs your gray-white differentiation. And that is seen about 50 to 70% of the time within the first three hours after a stroke. And this was indeed a real stroke. So what about this case here? Give you a second to look at it. You see anything? No, me neither. So. Uh, Showing this case to remind you that uh, none of the above is sometimes an option on the test. So normal, it's possible for an answer choice to be normal, which is the radiology equivalent of none of the above, which for me is like the hardest question, really un unnerving. But I'm going to give you some, some strategy or some things to put in your mind with regard to this. So um, the monitors aren't good for looking at radiology. You're not looking at uh, an actual high-res monitor, like a barcode monitor. And because of that, the person, their people who write the test, they know that. So they're not going to show you eye tests, probably. It would be cruel, it'd be very cruel to show you an eye test. So if you're having trouble making the finding, it's probably not, there's probably not there. Uh, if you're trying to talk yourself into some kind of little ditzel, something somewhere, it's probably not there. So if you're, if you're having to do that, and normal is a choice, it's probably normal. Also, just like um, how all of the above is usually the answer when it's provided, none of the above is also usually the answer when it's provided. So if you see normal and, you, and you're at all on the fence, that's what I would pick. So here's a follow-up. 
Um, and let's practice running through the imaging sequences again. It's an important skill uh, for multiple choice. So let's do this first one. All right, so CSF is bright, uh, so that's T2. Um, this one here, let's see. We've got CSF is dark, so that's T1. What? That's not T1. I almost said T1. Did you almost see t say T1? If you did, that was wrong. Uh, this is flare. Well, how do I know it's flare? Uh, CSF is dark. You have to look at the white matter. So remember, white matter is white on T1. White matter is dark on T2. So here's a T2. Let's look. See how the white matter is dark? White matter is also dark here, so that's a flare. White matter is white on T1. Use that for T1. Otherwise, you get your T1 and flare mixed up, potentially. Um, and then down here is obviously diffusion and an ADC. So what I'm showing here is that there is indeed a, a, an area of restricted diffusion. Not everything that restricts diffusion is a stroke. Remember, lots of other stuff can do that. Certain infections, uh, CJD can cause a gyroform restricted diffusion. Herpes can restrict diffusion. Bacterial abscess can restrict diffusion. Um, atypical infections sometimes don't. Uh, that's, that's worth knowing. Um, hypercellular tumors restrict diffusion. Classic one is lymphoma, but it can also be uh, medulloblastoma or uh, GBMs can restrict diffusion. Um, hematomas can restrict diffusion. Okay, so... Uh, we do have an area of restricted diffusion because we're talking about stroke. I'll tell you that it is a stroke. And then I want you to notice this right here. Flare is normal. This is a specific situation where you've got a stroke and the flare is normal. Uh, so let's review this big, very busy chart. Um, and I'm going to point that out to you. Okay, so hyperacute strokes, the flare can be normal, not bright. Um, and that's the take home. So if you see restricted diffusion, you're thinking that it's a stroke and a flare is normal, that can be the case within the first six hours. All right, we've got a case here with restricted diffusion. So uh, for sure that's a stroke because nothing else restricts diffusion. Wrong, wrong. Remember, don't get tricked on that. Don't get tricked on that. Not everything that restricts diffusion is a stroke. Uh, what if I showed you this case first where I showed you the T2 first. This one. You just, oh, boom, herpes, right? That's an ant many. Um, but it's restricting diffusion. Does that mess you up? Shouldn't, because restricted diffusion is the most sensitive or early sign of herpes encephalitis. So it can definitely restrict diffusion. But how do I know? So what if I told you... Um, or what if I was family medicine comes down and they say, we think he has an MCA distribution infarct. Would that fit with just these two pictures right here? Could, that's MCA distributions, restricting diffusions, flare is bright. So if it was more than six hours, it could be. So what do you, how are you gonna prove that? How are you gonna tell? What are you gonna do next? You're gonna look up at the basal ganglia, right? So MCA infarcts, typically, usually, involve the basal ganglia. So if that's spared, think herpes. If it's not spared, think an MCA infarct. Speaking of infarcts, three cases, red, orange, and yellow, all showing infarcts, different distributions. This first one is a classic, okay? So this is an ACA infarct. Uh, it can be shown at the very first cut or can be shown down further on here. The next one is a little stranger, right? Sort of bilateral thalamus, paramedian thalamus location. That is the artery of Percheron infarct. And this last one is another weird one, has a name to it. Right in the caudate head, that is the recurrent artery of Huebner. So let's review these. So here's your normal circle of Willis. Let's take a zoom in here. Um, so these are your normal perforating uh, thalamic vessels here. And notice that they're just multiple ones coming off. So if you had, uh, if you stroked one of these things out, like let's say this one right here, that would just hit one side of the thalamus. It would be hard to get them all, right? What if you had 
vascular anatomy that did this, where you had a vessel that came off sort of like on one side, and then those thalamic perforators come out of that. Then, if you took this thing out here, you could see how that would hit both thalami, right? So this is the artery of Percheron. Um, it is a variant anatomy and creates a very characteristic appearance on stroke. So paramedian thalamus, and if you're lucky, they'll show you this V appearance of the midbrain here. That's a classic look. So there's actually a differential um, for hypodense lesions in the thalami bilateral. There's three things. Uh, artery percheron is the one we mentioned, but you can also have this in Wernicke's or internal cerebral vein thrombosis. So this would make a good, which of the following is not on the differential? So you could have uh, number letter D, which is uh, could be uh, grilled cheese sandwich or whatever, anything, doesn't matter. Um, okay, so moving on to the recurrent artery of Hubener. So what is that thing? So I've got a coronal, cartoon coronal image of the brain that I drew here, and I labeled the A1 and ACOM branches. The artery of Hubener comes off like that, and it feeds the thalamic, or the caudate head. Um, so what do you need to know about this? Uh, first of all, you need to know that it originates from branch of the proximal ACA, usually. Uh, you need to know that it infarction is involved in the caudate head on one side, um, just like I showed. And the last thing you need to know is the classic clinical scenario, which is after an ACOM clipping. So remember that neurosurgeons are actually terrible surgeons most of the time, so if you get one of them that's sort of monkeying around in this general area here, you can imagine it'd be pretty easy for him to, to bag that artery of Hubener. Okay, so people who have strokes uh, tend sometimes end up with bleeds, hemorrhagic conversion they call it. Uh, so let's sort of review that real fast. Who gets that? Um, it's common. It happens about half the time that you have an infarct, so about 50% of the time people with a stroke will have some hemorrhagic infarct. And it comes in two flavors, um, the bad one, which is this one, and the good one, which is this one, and good because it's just a little bit. So people will call this petechial hemorrhage. This one is about 90% of the time, and this one is about 10% of the time when you do have a bleed. So the bad ones are uncommon, but they can occur. So who gets the who gets a bleed? Who's at risk? These are the this this would be some good trivia. So anyone who's anticoagulated, and that includes people who've gotten TPA, are at increased risk for bleeding. Large territories, so greater than one third of the MCA distribution, they're at risk. Or if they've had multiple strokes, so they've got a lot of brain that's that's injured. Um, Another thing that sometimes ask is proximal MCA occlusion. You can remember that because that's going to result in more than a third of the MCA being taken out, probably. And lastly, venous infarcts are more likely to bleed relative to arterial infarcts. Okay, so next case here. Um, let's review the sequences. Important to do that. So you can't really see the CSF for sure, but it looks dark. White matter is white, so that is T1. I'll just help you out that if you can see this little little speck right here, little speck right here, um, this is actually a hemosiderin-sensitive sequence. That's a little trickier. This one's diffusion, obviously. Uh, so we got bright stuff, bright stuff on T1. That's blood, right? Just talking about petechial hemorrhage. Is that petechial hemorrhage? So... Remember I said there was three reasons why hemosiderin sequence will be shown on multiple choice. One was amyloid. Two was a cavernoma. And three was to either prove or disprove the presence of blood products. So that's the scenario we're looking at here where we've got something here that we think is blood, but then we were provided with a hemosiderin sequence, and we see that it's 
clearly not blood because there's no blood products. So if it's not blood, then what is it? So remember, there's a list of stuff that's also T1 bright, and that you'd have that sort of at the, on the tip of your tongue or on the tip of your finger. So um, blood is subacute blood is T1 bright. Um, uh, fat is T1 bright. Melanin is T1 bright. Hyaluronized calcium is T1 bright. Proteinaceous material is T1 bright. So there is an entity called cortical laminar necrosis, which is T1 bright. It's gyriform curvilinear right at the end. It's seen after a stroke. So if we go back to this case, that was the second hint that was provided. He has had a stroke. Okay, so this is in a situation where the dude has had a stroke that's just not a bleed. Uh, if this was petechial hemorrhage, it could have looked just like that, except you would expect there to be signal in the SWI. Um, so it occurs after about two weeks or so or around a month, and it can go away. It's not forever. And it's basically accumulation of dead cells and protein um, that makes it look T1 bright. So it's like basically like cholesterol or proteinaceous, high-density crap that's making it look like blood. It's not blood, though. That's the trick. Okay, so next case, I'm going to tell you this is a six-month-old, and that's important. Let's review this real fast. This is a T2, right? But because I said that because the CSF is bright, but it's weird, right, because the white matter is white. The white matter is supposed to be white on T1, not T2, but this is a kid. So remember in peds, on T1, you don't look like an adult until you're one, and on T2, you don't look like you're an adult until you're two. So this kid is less than two, um, so he doesn't, he, he, it's flipped, it looks the other way, because he hasn't myelinated his white matter yet. All right, so the purpose of this case is not to review that necessarily. It's to show you this, here and here. So bilateral areas of restricted diffusion, as we scroll down, they're sort of deep, okay? Bilateral multiple layers. So this kid has had some kind of badness. So let's review this. This is vascular territories. Um, and the area in between these things, like right where they come together, that is what people call the watershed areas, and these are areas of, they're vulnerable to ischemic injury, so any kind of hypotensive episode or low oxygen state. They're also the areas where um, septic emboli tend to get thrown. And I'm going to talk about sort of how you can tell the difference between them as a generalization. So there's two categories. One is the external areas, and one are the deeper areas, the internal watershed areas. So when you're looking at the external areas, those would be the ones I've got color-coded in orange here, think about uh, embolic stuff more on the outside. And the reason, to, the way to remember that is if you have normal blood pressure, you can shoot those emboli further out, and these do better. The internal ones are the yellow ones, they, that is more likely to be from a uh, ischemic or hemodynamic compromise, uh, so the low prep blood pressure situation, because it's not being able to push out as further, and these tend to have uh, crappier prognosis. So next case here, we've got a lot of blood in the head, and I'm going to give you some history. This kid has... This is a kid, and uh, he has sickle cell. Okay, so, hmm. So, um, what do you what are you thinking now? Um, actually, he's not he's not that much of a kid. Let's say he's he's forty and he has sickle cell. He still has sickle cell. Buzzword sickle cell. So, I say sickle cell, and you say moya moya, right? Um, the the next step could provide you with this, CTA. Remember what Moya Moya has? Moya Moya has this. It has, um, it has ICA, proximal ICA, supraclinoid, 
ICA uh, high-grade narrowing or occlusion. And it also has this, a, quote, puff of smoke appearance on angiography. So think about it like this. You've got high-grade stenosis. It's occurring slowly over time, and because of that, you're recruiting lots of collaterals, lots of collaterals, and but they're abnormal tangles of vessels, so um, they're prone to bleeding. And in kids, they're they're prone to stroke, specifically in those watershed areas. So if you have a kid who has a stroke, that's ab abnormal, right? Abnormal thing, rare thing, rare rare diagnosis. So rare diagnosis, moya moya, just sounds rare, right? Rare thing, kid with a stroke. So I say kid with a stroke, watershed areas, you say moya moya. Um, I say moya moya, you say sickle cell. Uh, sickle cell in a kid equals a stroke, sickle cell in an adult equals a bleed. Uh, moya moya can be caused by more than just sickle cell, anything that can cause narrowing of the vasculature slowly over time can cause that abnormal proliferation of collateral vessels. Okay, so this case here is a coronal T1 post contrast. And what I'm showing you is this. We've got a sort of an abnormal vessel. It's not seen on the other side. A uh, linear looking thing. So when you see this, this is the peanut butter. Then you have to look for the jelly. All right, so here comes the jelly. Um, see this right here, hemosiderin sequence? What were the three reasons you see hemosiderin sequence? Amyloid, cavernoma, and to prove or disprove the presence of blood, right? So this is the cavernoma case. Um, notice that it's solitary. It's not spread around. I didn't give you a history of an old person with on dialysis, renal failure, etc. It's not a big low bar hemorrhage. So you're not thinking necessarily it's amyloid. I will tell you, you can have multiple cavernomas. Hispanic people uh, tend to have, uh, you know, there's the familiar thing where you have multiple cavernomas. But you, you're shown a DVA, immediately think cavernoma. Um, you're shown a cavernoma, look for the DVA. They go together, um, peas and carrots, peanut butter and jelly. Um, so what is a cavernoma? Cavernomas are low flow, vascular malformations, they do not have normal intervening tissue, uh, they have a popcorn or peripheral appearance of their hemosiderin, they can bleed but they tend to ooze more than actually have catastrophic bleed, and you need to look for the DVA. All right, another kind of low, fo low flow venous malformation, this time it's centered in the pons, so I say venous malformation in the pons, you say capillary t lunctasia. This is a classic location. It's supposed to look like a paintbrush brushed it on. Um, it does, does have normal intervening brain tissue. Cavernomas don't. That's a distinction. Uh, anytime you have something like that, it makes for a good distractor. Um, they also tend to not bleed ever. Um, they're totally incidental, and uh, they can occur as a complication of, like, total brain radiation or scalp radiation. Okay, so um, next case here, this person is 40, and the finding is this and this. We've got some edema-looking stuff in the temporal lobes. All right, so... 40, wow, for 40, that's really severe white matter disease. So when you see bad white matter disease in a 40-year-old, you should think two things. The first thing is MS, but if you're going to show me MS, you better show me it on the sagittal. You better show me that closal septal interface. Um, and if you're not showing me that and you're just showing me axials, I'm going to think about this diagnosis, which is catacil, especially when you show me the temporal lobes. Temporal lobes involved, yes. Occipital lobes involved, no, that is catacil, okay? Another thing that you could be shown to sort of strengthen this would be a normal MRA. A normal MRA should make you think, uh, oh, well, he doesn't have some weird vascular thing that's making him have such bad white matter disease. So catacil 
couple of things you need to know about it. First one is that it is inherited. The AD is for autosomal dominant. It does have, it can have strokes and also bad white matter disease. The classic history is a 40-year-old with migraine. Okay, this is the classic thing to know right here. Migraine, catacel, migraine. Um, the other thing to know is bad white matter disease that's not MS, involves the temporal lobe, spares the occipital lobe. Involves the temporal lobe, spares the occipital lobe. Okay, so last case. This is just um, a refresher on the uh, North American Symptomatic Carotid Endarterectomy Trial, or NASET, uh, how you do measurements. So if you've done this in residency, you've probably done it a bunch of times. Um, if you've not done it, if it's something the fellows do or you guys don't do, I'm just going to review it real fast. So there's a calculation that's done to grade uh, the stenosis in the ICA for the purpose of risk stratification for surgery. Um, and as you would probably imagine, you will measure an area of maximum stenosis here and then an area up here somewhere. So where do you want to measure? Well, obviously, you're going to want to measure the area of maximum stenosis, so like right there. And then you want to compare it to the parallel, not curved, distal segment that is normal. So ways you can mess this up would be if you decided you wanted to measure it here, something that's proximal or down here. No, it has to be distal. And if you were trying to find something that wasn't parallel, or if you were trying to find something that wasn't normal, like if this was an area that was also narrowed, find a normal spot, find one that's distal, find one that's parallel. Okay, so that's done with this lecture, and the next talk is going to be a rapid review of what's testable with regarding to trauma.